Hello and welcome to Sound Strategic. I'm Maya Nowens. Hi, I'm Antonio Sampaio. In today's episode, we will be discussing how Russia has been handling the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. To do this, we are joined by Nigel Gold Davis, our new Senior Fellow for Russia and Eurasia and editor of the IISS's Strategic Survey. Prior to joining the IISS, Nigel served for 10 years in the British Foreign and Commonwealth Office, including as head of the economic section in Moscow and as ambassador to Belarus. He has also had held senior government relations roles in Central and Southeast Asia and taught international relations at Oxford University. Welcome, Nigel, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to take part in my first podcast for IISS. So Russia seems to have been less affected by COVID-19 than many European countries. Is this an accurate assessment or has there been a problem, do you think, of underreporting cases, as some Western journalists have suggested? I would say at this stage that uh, Russia itself, at least at an official level, underestimated uh, the likelihood of it being affected by the coronavirus. And unfortunately, that assumption is being challenged now by events on the ground. So uh, if we go back to uh, late January, when coronavirus was first becoming a global concern, Russia initially appeared to move uh, very quickly. Even before its first cases were recorded, Russia moved to close its long Far Eastern border with China. A few cases then began to uh, appear in Russia, but still, as you say, very small numbers. And Russia itself seemed to be pretty relaxed about the prospects of any significant uh, infection. So while some measures were taken to begin to restrict more international flights from not only from China but from other countries, almost no domestically oriented measures uh, were taken. And as you say, for a long time this, uh, this puzzle appeared. Why is the virus affecting so many countries uh, more severely than Russia? Suspicions began to grow that the uh, inadvertently or uh, deliberately uh, the statistics were underreported. Uh, some people did notice a jump in cases of uh, pneumonia not attributable to coronavirus. Uh, but that picture has changed very quickly and uh, the Russian authorities have been uh, catching up with that. So if you go back to uh, late March, uh, television uh, in Russia uh, for the first time showed Putin visiting a hospital with coronavirus patients and then the next day, uh, the first significant domestic measures began to be announced uh, by Putin himself. Uh, sadly, that has not stemmed the, uh, the escalation in the problem. And over the past week, every day, we've seen record jumps in the number of recorded cases. We're now at about 7,500 cases overall. Uh, fortunately, only around 60 deaths so far, but there are real concerns that these uh, figures will continue to grow. So uh, for now, um, as you as you suggested, Putin and the pro-Kremlin media have been careful to portray a country and a government on top of things. But also Putin um, appears to uh, place a lot of uh, his political charisma and, and capital into this image of uh, a leader in control of, of everything. Um, what are the political implications of coronavirus for Putin and his grip on Russian uh, political opinion? For instance, his plans to introduce some constitutional um, changes that would allow him to stay in power well into the 2030s. Is, is that uh, in any way threatened by this uh, pandemic? Yes, well, uh, two points here, I think. First, as you say, Putin likes to portray himself as a strong and proactive leader uh, firmly in control. Uh, the paradox, perhaps, of the handling of the coronavirus crisis so far is that Putin has played a much lower profile than one might assume. He's made two uh, and only two television appearances, uh, addresses to the nation about this. Uh, the day-to-day -day handling of the crisis seems to have been delegated to other people, in particular to Sergei Sobyanin, who is the, uh, the long-standing mayor of Moscow, which is the most affected uh, city, around 80 percent, uh, nearly 90 percent, in fact, of the cases so far have been recorded in Moscow. 
and Sobyanin is also a close uh, associate of Putin. He was once uh, head of the presidential uh, administration. Uh, Putin has also delegated a lot of the uh, the, the measures uh, to be taken uh, to regional governors, which shines the spotlight on their capabilities or limitations and the resources that they uh, may or may not have at their disposal. I think there are potential sort of problems there. So it's surprising that Putin has uh, been less active. There have been reports from uh, Moscow that Putin has been reluctant to take more uh, concerted action uh, an earlier lockdown, for example, uh, because of his concern about the impact on his uh, popularity ratings. And indeed, Putin, in the last couple of weeks, is one of the few leaders around the world whose popularity has actually fallen, uh, albeit slightly, um, as a consequence or in the wake of the coronavirus. So the second point is about those constitutional amendments that you mentioned. Yes, this is a package developed at the beginning of this year. It would mark the most significant uh, series of amendments to the 1993 Constitution so far. Uh, that uh, a process of sort of shepherding them through the uh, the, the approvals uh, uh, procedures led to uh, an important uh, amendment in early March uh, that would allow Putin, as you say, to stand again for the presidency uh, and in 2024 and potentially allow him to remain uh, into uh, in that position into 2036. He announced as one of his anti-virus measures that that uh, constitutional uh, amendment would have to be postponed. The package of measures, which he specifically said he wanted to be passed in a referendum, constitutional amendments do not require a referendum, but it's one way to push them through, He's now specifically saying that uh, that has to be uh, postponed. Uh, so, yes, that uh, agenda was dominating Russian politics until coronavirus came along. Coronavirus has now completely trumped that. It's not clear at this point how and when these very significant constitutional amendments, in which Putin himself places enormous significance, will actually be passed. Maybe turning um, to uh, it, Russia's relationship with the United States and its more closer neighbors, um, Russia has, whilst it's dealing with its own internal uh, epidemic of COVID-19, also played a role in um, delivering humanitarian aid and assistance through what has been dubbed, in China's practice at least, mask diplomacy. So we've seen a shipment um, delivered to the United States, I believe, of masks, um, or at least the promise thereof, and similarly to Italy um, as well. How do you think Putin's Russia at the moment is seizing this opportunity, whether, if at all, he is seizing the opportunity to use this pandemic for soft power leverage or influence or um, disinformation purposes? Yes. I think we do see uh, some evidence here that uh, whatever difficulties Russia itself faces domestically from coronavirus, it is also trying to uh, use the opportunities it, pr it presents to spread its influence uh, in other countries. And two examples in particular uh, that you've mentioned. First, uh, with respect to Italy, uh, on the, the 22nd of March, uh, Russia began to send uh, coronavirus related aid uh, and a significant number of people uh, to Italy to, to, to help combat the, the epidemic there. What was interesting in this case is that these are not civilian health workers, they are from uh, the Russian military. Uh, over a hundred uh, military virologists were sent with equipment, uh, eight mobile brigades. This is something as you can imagine, that uh, may well be alarming to uh, to other NATO members. It's a pretty uh, unprecedented uh, military uh, assistance measure. Uh, why is Russia doing this? I think one reason is that Italy is seen as a weaker link in the EU common position in respect of uh, sanctions against Russia, which the EU has imposed since 2014, 
and which have to be uh, renewed uh, by unanimity among EU members every six months or so. Uh, so far, that uh, common front has held, but it is known that there are some countries that are perhaps less inclined to uh, continue to support those sanctions, and Italy is generally regarded as uh, as one of those countries. So I think there is an influence, for, uh, uh, and I think there is a, an intention for specific uh, sanctions-related uh, goals to, uh, to to influence Italian opinion on this. And and then there was the uh, announcement that Russia had sent aid to the United States. Not all the details of this have been made public. It seems, in fact, that America bought uh, rather than was donated uh, that material. Especially significant here is the fact that some of the ventilators that Russia sold to the United States were reportedly manufactured by a Russian company under sanctions. So, uh, in principle, Americans would not be able to purchase or do any kind of business with this company, yet America itself, the American government, has bought uh, medical equipment from this. It's an embarrassment, it seems to me, for uh, the United States, but a further way in which Russia seeks to send the message that really, uh, in these times, it's better not to uh, have these sanctions. It's better to uh, uh, for these sanctions to be lifted. And uh, Putin has said it as much uh, in the latest G20 uh, meeting. He said, now is the time to suspend uh, all sanctions. So I do see here signs of trying to turn a crisis into an opportunity. I mean, that is fascinating because, of course, um, whereas that applies to Russia, it also applies to countries like Iran, uh, which the United States government has resolutely said they will absolutely not be lifting or softening sanctions um, due to the pandemic uh, towards Iran. And when it comes to Iran, um, arguing, for example, that humanitarian aid isn't isn't listed under those sanctions. So um, for this to have gone very differently in Russia's case, I think, is perhaps another another signal to um, uh, outside observers that uh, the US's relationship with Russia at the moment is a little bit different to that of to that of other countries or, or other previous administrations uh, yes uh, I suppose I, I and I'd add here uh, an irony that uh, at the G20 summit Putin called for a so-called green corridor of humanitarian aid that to coronavirus stricken countries uh, that would uh, include the suspension of uh, sanctions. Now it's precisely those kinds of green corridors for humanitarian aid that, that Russia and its ally uh, Syria ha has typically denied to embattled uh, civilians in the course of the, the civil conflict in Syria. Nigel, you've mentioned sanctions. Um, Russia's economy wasn't exactly thriving before this pandemic. So is it possible, it is quite early stages and appears that Russia has been less affected uh, so far than other countries, but is it possible to identify or estimate, um, have an idea of the economic consequences that this pandemic may, may have on Russia? Yes. Uh, as you say, uh, Russia has not been doing well recently. So while all countries in the world will be uh, affected uh, economically, as well as medically by coronavirus. In the case of Russia, uh, the country is not uh, starting from a good base, so to speak. Real disposable incomes have been falling for the past five years or so, barely crawling above uh, 1% in terms of uh, aggregate GDP, GDP growth. So uh, a range of estimates is beginning to, uh, to come in now. Uh, the best case estimates that Russian GDP will fall by around 3%. But that is a low estimate. Uh, others are saying 5%. The Russian government's own worst case scenario suggests around 10%. Now that's even more than Russia suffered during the 2008 global financial crash. Uh, at that time, Russia was the worst affected of the, the G20 countries. Now exacerbating the problem of coronavirus is the recent collapse of the oil market. Uh, this is partly a consequence of the uh, the demand shock uh, 
caused by coronavirus itself, a drastic decline in global economic activity, especially transport, has a huge impact on the, the demand for oil. But in addition to that, early last month, in early March, uh, the, the so-called OPEC plus agreement between Saudi Arabia and Russia uh, fell apart. Uh, those two countries that had been cooperating on uh, maintaining limits on oil production, uh, they, uh, that agreement between them ended. Russia did not wish to uh, continue uh, the cuts. And what we've seen now is essentially both countries, Russia and Saudi Arabia, uh, trying to increase their global oil sales at precisely the time when demand is drastically uh, declining. That has had an extraordinary effect on the oil price, uh, which, uh, which fell almost into single digits at one point. There's now a complex game uh, being played between Russia, Saudi Arabia and the United States about whether they can uh, reach an agreement that would stabilize uh, the uh, uh, oil prices at a, at a higher level. But the point here is, uh, for Russia, uh, they are fundamentally dependent on revenues from oil and gas exports. This comprises uh, a very large proportion uh, of their budget and uh, is a key driver of growth. So Russia now faces unusually a double whammy. Uh, the impact of coronavirus and the drastic measures now beginning to be introduced into Russia to handle the coronavirus crisis, plus, in addition, a drastic decline in key export earnings. So I would not be surprised if, uh, as a consequence of both of those factors, the impact uh, of uh, this year taken as a whole would be at least as severe as the global financial crisis, uh, very likely uh, more so. Mm -hmm. With this impact, and also with some figures, uh, some publications, both external and internal, and also um, figures in the opposition, the Russian opposition um, of Alexei Navalny, um, sort of accusing the government of covering up at least some cases of, of coronavirus, I wonder if we can um, say something at this point about what the public impact um, uh, what the impact has had has been on the uh, image, the public image, the public perception of Putin uh, and his response to, to the coronavirus. It seems quite a consequential issue, given the referendum that he wants to put forward for his constitutional changes. Yes, well, uh, Putin is, is one of the few leaders around the world whose popularity has suffered in recent weeks. Uh, we've seen uh, other leaders uh, for example, and Boris Johnson and uh, and Donald Trump as well, perhaps more surprisingly, given uh, the difficult uh, direction that, that the crisis is taking there, uh, these leaders and others like them have seen their popularity rise. Uh, and yet Putin's has fallen by about four or five uh, percent. And uh, so for some, there is a, 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 a memory of... Uh, one of the first crises that Putin faced when he became president back in 2000. There was a, a, a naval tragedy. Uh, the Kursk uh, submarine uh, sank uh, and all the, 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 the people on board uh, tragically lost their lives. Now, um, that was a, a difficult experience for Putin himself, who had not previously had a great deal of experience at handling public opinion. He'd been prime minister a few for a few months before he became president, but had not occupied a, a public role before then. And he, uh, he misplayed that situation. He was uh, absent and, and seen as absent a long way away from the crisis, did not interrupt his vacation at the time, and was criticized for it. Now, he's clearly learned a tremendous amount in the past 20 years. Uh, and yet, uh, there is the surprise that he's not taking a more uh, high profile uh, role. Um, there is uh, uh, informed speculation that he has been uh, reluctant to take firmer measures to combat the virus precisely because he's worried about the impact on his own uh, popularity. Uh, better, therefore, perhaps in his calculation, to let others take difficult decisions and to uh, draw the criticism or the blame that might follow from those. Um, and um, 
uh, as you say again the the complication to his plans to uh, amend the constitution many amendments actually uh, several quite important ones the most hope high profile of course being the one that would allow him to uh, stand again uh, after 2024 uh, we'll see what happens uh, to those uh, it's not they're in a limbo at the moment uh, he may simply say well uh, we'll postpone it until the, the virus is over the problem then is that if his popularity has fallen further in effect such a referendum would become a uh, a referendum on his own popularity it may be more difficult to get the support and the turnout that he would need to validate uh, these constitutional amendments or he may just say well I've changed my mind uh, these constitutional amendments still need to be passed but we'll use one of the other ways provided for by the Constitution to pass them thereby short-circuiting uh, the referendum so we'll see what happens to those to those things uh, it's not a, an urgent matter at this point but it is something that he will need to deal with in due course turning maybe a bit more to the far east I was wondering whether you could comment on Russia's relationship with China um, throughout this um, global pandemic and how that might have evolved. You said that Russia had very early on closed its borders to China. We've seen from um, other countries' experiences who have closed borders to China or um, stopped or halted temporarily flights from China that there was a negative um, repercussion on the side of uh, the Chinese government being quite displeased with such actions. And Russia and China have over the past few years, of course, grown quite close to one another in terms of um, political relationships and strategic relationships. Um, how has this been affected by the pandemic? Yes, uh, China was not best pleased when Russia uh, closed the border back at the end of January and there were reports thereafter, complaints from China that uh, in Moscow, the epicenter of uh, Russia's coronavirus uh, crisis that Chinese citizens were being sort of singled out by detained by uh, local police and that didn't go down particularly well uh, either uh, beyond that I think that the coronavirus issue that the larger challenges it uh, presents to political and health and economic systems in, in these two countries and elsewhere is is at this moment eclipsing the difficulties that this might present to um, the bilateral relationship specifically. I suppose one further point to note here is that in the context of uh, Russia's now escalating attempts to, uh, to uh, uh, combat the crisis uh, with the lockdown in Moscow now and in the majority, although not all, of Russia's uh, other regions uh, Russia is looking now to roll out more intensive and intrusive uh, surveillance systems than it has in the past uh, there's discussions for example of requiring anyone who wants to leave their house to have a QR code to show to to any uh, uh, law enforcement official who uh, who uh, detains them now uh, there, are, there have been suggestions that Russia, uh, in respect to this form of these forms of technology, might borrow from or, or draw upon China's experience of mass uh, social surveillance. Um, so that's potentially an area of cooperation for them. Interesting. I mean, I think China's own experience with um, using and leveraging new technologies and surveillance technologies um, to affect its own lockdowns has been um, has been heavily reported on but of course there were a lot of uniquely Chinese low-tech solutions as well that uh, might have received uh, less attention um, using for example um, neighborhood guards or, or building um, specific um, people whose job it is to keep an eye on a certain building in a neighborhood to ferry um, food from a gate to a front door um, so it, it's not all it's not all high tech but it is interesting to see how how tech is being used across um, 
different countries and, and different um, societies to deal with the global pandemic. And that might be a, an interesting topic to explore further in a, in a future episode. I was wondering also, um, looking at China, it's interesting to note that whilst it is still facing economic and um, health challenges at home as a response, as a result of COVID-19, um, the PLA has continued its operations in the South China Sea. The Chinese Coast Guard has remained active in protecting what China views as its um, inherent rights in that region. Um, and we've seen almost a reminder to Taiwan that uh, the PLA has not forgotten about one of its core interests, which is territorial integrity and reunification at some point. Um, has the Russian military, um, other than the humanitarian aid mission to Italy, been equally um, active? Or has there been a halt? Uh, there's no public evidence so far of a halt. Uh, the Russian authorities have made clear that they still plan the spring call up, that is to say, the uh, to call up the new um, conscripts for uh, conscription into what is still substantially a, a, a conscription uh, military. In practice, it's long been the case that. Uh, uh, people with resources or connections can avoid a uh, conscription. Nonetheless, in, in principle, the system still exists. Uh, now, uh, Russia has made clear that the virus will not uh, interfere with those uh, regular plans. Uh, there will be measures to ensure that new conscripts uh, are not infected with the virus uh, and to, to make sure that they are safe to join uh, their uh, new comrades there. Uh, but I agree with you that in respect of China and Russia and indeed other countries as well, uh, it will be important to uh, follow closely uh, whether and how these affect military uh, capacity, uh, including in, in respect of the planned uh, exercises. And that will be an important marker, I think, of the potential of the virus in many countries to affect the security situation, the security readiness of these countries. So Nigel, um, a document recently leaked by the Financial Times from the European Union Diplomatic Service um, states uh, that the pro-Kremlin media uh, in Russia have engaged in a significant, quote, significant disinformation campaign, um, um, unquote, uh, to spread confusion and fear in Europe about, about coronavirus. At the same time, some reports suggest that actually they were sort of tabloids in, in Russia uh, doing that. So it's not very clear. But um, what, what can we uh, uh, assess from the information so far on potential disinformation from Russia on, on this issue? Yes, there have been a number of uh, stories and, and media items that have uh, emanated from Russia that have uh, portrayed uh, false and misleading uh, uh, impressions of the uh, of the virus. Uh, some of them simply silly. Some of them a bit more uh, sinister and mischievous. Now, in some cases, I think these are just individuals freelancing and being, uh, as it were, uh, irresponsible in a private capacity. But uh, it seems there are other cases where uh, accounts and individuals uh, with links to uh, the Kremlin have been. Uh, involved in this sort of uh, messaging as well. And uh, it's, uh, in a sense, predictable, all of a piece with uh, efforts that uh, that Russia has made in recent years uh, to exploit other issues, to sow uh, discord and, uh, and uncertainty and distrust in Western societies. Uh, sometimes the, the goal of these campaigns is not so much to uh, present a different argument or different version of the truth, but to create uncertainty and confusion, to persuade uh, a critical mass of public opinion elsewhere that there is really no one we can believe at all. And that's uh, almost uh, as dangerous uh, a situation as, as people believing simply a false uh, version. Uh, it's a timely question because just yesterday, uh, Russia Today, uh, the Russian broadcaster, uh, reported uh, that uh, Boris Johnson was actually on a ventilator. This is a uh, an allegation uh, furiously uh, refuted uh, by uh, number 10 
I was reading uh, a, a long article just today in uh, what had once been a, a respectable Russian journal, uh, International Affairs, uh, uh, which uh, alleged or at least suggested, among other things, that uh, Britain was in some sense behind uh, the coronavirus. And it was a plan to, uh, to make sure that the sun never set on the British Empire. It was uh, uh, mischievous nonsense. And uh, it's, uh, it's unfortunate these things, uh, these campaigns are being mounted. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you very much uh, for um, providing us with, uh, with your analysis today. So Nigel Gu Davis, who is our new senior fellow for Russia and Eurasia, and also editor of the ISS Strategic Survey, one of our annual publications. Um, so that's it for this week. Please subscribe to Sound Strategic for more in-depth discussions like this. We are doing a series of um, programs and interviews on the global impact of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. And to keep up to date with this issue and others um, in international security and armed conflicts, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. So thank you and see you next time.